Awesome. All right, I think we are live. Let me check here real quick. Um, it says we're going, so um, I'm here with Frank Marlowe, and here we're here to talk about Homer and politics, specifically the Iliad and the Odyssey, and not the other lost texts that Homer apparently has written. So, uh, Frank, why don't you tell me what your introduction to Homer was? When did you first read him? When did I first read? I think I first officially read the Iliad. I, I may have read the Iliad when I was, you know, a child and just didn't remember it in the kids' version. But I remember reading, actually, the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, very recently, more so the Iliad. Um, I remember the Odyssey from when I was younger and I was reading Greek mythology. But it was very recent, actually, about a couple months ago, when I read uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and I don't know, it just, it kind of transfixed me to something, you know, just this this different mentality, you know, where this, this sense of honor and the sense of, you know, fate and the sense of, you know, you keep going forward even if you're not sure, even if you're sure or not sure what the odds may be for you living longer, you know? Yeah, the the idea of accepting your fate and trying to find meaning when you're fated uh, to die, if nothing else, but perhaps yes. to do other things, is, is definitely not a modern vision, where the, the modern progressive view seems to be very much that uh, we are in control, that there are things we can do to change our fate, whereas the Greeks seem to have a fixed view of fate. Absolutely, you know, even in the me even in media nowadays, you tend to see every time there's any sort of supernatural um, element to it, you know, even if there are gods or even within the sort of demonology shows like Supernatural and shows like that, there's always this sense of, oh, the heroes can, you know, fight fate and, you know, they can overcome no matter what, and th that's sort of, you know, fate in hand, type, what I call type of deal, whereas, like you said, the ancient Greeks had a very fixed view of fate meaning you made your choices, but your fate was still the same. Yeah, and uh, and even Zeus was not more powerful than the, the fates. The only one I remember the name of is Atropos, because there happened to be a, a video game character of that name that I nice. used to play back when I was in high school. But uh, I believe, uh, if I remember the names correctly, and I'm going to probably botch the pronunciation, Atropos is the one you mentioned, and I believe she's the cutter. Kletos, or Klepos, I'm not sure of the pronunciation there. And... Kleos, Atropos, I'm forgetting uh, the middle one, because <laughs> I believe Kleipos is the one who weaves the fade, Atropos is the one who cuts it, I'm no. not sure of the middle one's name. We have the internet sure. now, it's Clotho, yes. like as in cloth, cloth, the spinner, Cloth, Clotho. and we have, we uh, oh I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, Lachesis, dispensed it, Lachesis, me I think. measured it, and then Atropos was the cutter, um, Yes. the determiner of the time of death, and yes. uh, one of the books, or, or rather the, the authors I was listening to recently, Daniel Mendelssohn, um, mm -hmm. mentioned that there, there seemed to be, uh, in the realm of classics, there were Iliad people and there were Odyssey people. And it's not as if fate isn't present in the Odyssey, um, because he was out to sea because he was fated to, to be lost. But there's, yes. it's, it seems to be a much stronger factor in the Iliad. The whole, the whole poem is, is just imbued with this dread sense of Achilles' impending doom. Even though he never actually dies in the poem. It's, it all seems, to, everything begins really with the fact that Achilles is supposed to, is going to die young. And honor is supposed to be his, his recompense for that early death. But he might even be denied that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you notice in the Iliad, um, um, the interaction between gods and man is, I don't know, it's just something that stood out to me in its own way. You know, the Greek gods, I think I mentioned this a while back when we last spoke, they have a reputation of being just, you know, jerks, basically, you know, very capricious, very, you know, um, at, at worst they are actively malicious, and at best they just operate on a very alien plane to what we would consider decent human behavior. Um, but in, for some odd reason I found myself, you know, thinking that, okay, maybe the gods act the way that they do because 
as you've said, even they can't escape uh, the fates, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I... Uh, I know it's not actually in the real poem, but in the movie Troy, there's that great line uh, where, where uh, Achilles, Brad Pitt, is telling Briseis, uh, you know, the gods envy us because we're mortal, and so everything we do is more meaningful because of our mortality. Um, we will never be here again. And I'll, the line itself is never actually said in the Iliad. No. But the, but the meaning conveyed there, I think, actually is latent in... In the poem, and I think something, something similar to that is is said in the Odyssey, if if memory serves. Though I'm, I, I I've been listening to both of them sort of intermittently with this other book, so my memory yeah. might be a little hazy on it. It's funny you mentioned Troy. Uh, that movie is probably the one of the reasons I got back into Greek mythology uh, when I was uh, middle school, high school. You know, I, I always loved it. You know, of course, but I think I started to get more, you know, I don't want to say back into it. I'm not sure what the right word would be, but I started to rediscover it, so to speak. Oh, yeah. It was um, an excellent it, movie. <laughs> oh, very much so, especially for Hollywood. You know, it was a very excellent movie. It's on par with Gladiator, you know, just that epic historical movie, you know. Yeah. And the fight scenes were pretty awesome, too. You can't, can't. Uh... Sure, yeah. I can't. No, yeah. Bronze. That showed how well bronze could do. <laughs> well, and, and that's one of the interesting things about the, the poem itself, the Iliad. Um, yeah. the, the fight scenes are absolutely uh, brutal, but one brutal. of the things yeah. that, one of the things that, uh, uh, the book I'm reading right now, the, the author of why Homer, uh, matters was saying is that when he describes that there's two distinct sounds that are described when a, a hero is killed in battle. There's first, there's this rep this repeated description of the sound of a corpse hitting the ground, like like a, uh, a tree falling down. And then there's uh -huh. another phrase that they use to describe the, the armor clattering around him. And that repetition, it's a bit like when you go to the to a range and you're shooting metal targets and there's that satisfaction that you get from from hearing that that clink of the bullet hitting the metal it's that yeah. same it's that same satisfaction that the warriors get in, in the glory of, of knocking down an enemy another one yeah. bites the dust as it were yeah. Uh, yeah and it's that weird dichotomy of absolute horror and brutality cuz they'll they'll give these descriptions of like you know, so brains so, falling out yeah so and so died and a a spear pierced his bladder from the buttocks and he screamed and the black death came over his eyes and then yeah, yeah. he'll he'll give these descriptions of like you, you know and he was a fine metal worker in his town but now his family will never know his great works of iron and bronze again and, and they will steel, all weep yeah and never, I and it's this they will all weep for his family. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's this strange dichotomy where it's it's both the horror and the glory of war at the same time. Absolutely, I think that was one of the things that really sort of tickled my brain, to use a weird phrase, um, where it's like, yes, it's brutal, it's bloody, it's gory, it's you know, they're you know getting stabbed with spears and swords and you know all these horrible things, but at the same time, you you feel this weird sense of, you know, this, this, I think the word is thumos I read a while back, where it's like this sort of, you know, energized blood rage, and you're just like, yeah, you know, they're overcoming their enemy, they're doing, you know, they're doing what they need to do in that particular moment, in that particular place, you know, and nothing else matters, and all that's focused on is just, you know, man versus enemy, you know? Yeah. Th th I heard thumos described as, as spiritedness. Um, yeah, w relating to the breath and also with some symbolism related to horses. I have this theory. Tell me what you think of this. Mm -hmm. Have you ever played Skyrim? Yes. What I'm you... a Breton. Hell yeah. <laughs> so, so <laughs> d tell tell me. Do you think how likely is it? Do you think that the the Skyrim designers borrowed the word thumos in the creation of the thum, the the voice? Uh, yeah. The, I the dragon spirit. I'm not sure, but it wouldn't surprise me. It, I think that is a very solid theory because, you know, uh, Thumos is, like you said, breath, spiritedness, you know, what I call the, the, the energy. Because in a way, in Skyrim, if you're projecting your voice, you're projecting sort of the spiritual energy 
you know, in that in that sense. Um, and yeah, I think that's actually a very good theory. You know, it's yeah. a sort of power flowing forth. Oh, it's an interesting digression, I suppose. It's it's yeah. incredible how how frequently many of these concepts come forward, but. Uh, the the idea of having spirit i was rereading nietzsche the other day and he at one point described um spiritual um spirituality and spiritness as being as essentially the um the ability to control your will and to not be distracted and, and pathologically um, made to do things that aren't in in your life it's a combination of patience and self-control and endurance basically and um the what's always struck me coming back to this matter of fate is that there there seems to be a modern notion that if you're fated to die if death is the end and you'll hear some christians say this too then you know nothing really matters you know, you may as well live live yes. for today, live for the moment. For tomorrow, we die, and the Iliad yes. have a very different approach. That. I've I've noticed that, and I think that's why I was, you know, for a while when I was in my teenage years, I was a bit anti-fate. You know, I did have that modern mentality of, oh, you know, we can control all of our actions. We are always in control, and on and on and on. Because I had Iliad, seen too many Odyssey people, and both, the... you know, in and out of life. Other they lost used, texts you know, this sort of first overarching it. fate as an excuse to be a nihilist. When did you I know, first read? I think I first... often nowadays, where it's like nothing else matters. You know, that whole modern mentality of, you know, um, if it makes you feel good, then I say do it. That sort of thing. So, and I mean, going back to where the Iliad is, where it's like, yes, you believe in this overarching fate, but at the same time, you are still honor bound duty bound to be the best man you can be so that way when you die they will sing your praises you know and I, I i find that very appealing to me you know sing your praises is a is a good line one of the beautiful sort of circular ironies but but not at the mm -hmm. book's own expense is is in the odyssey where it's revealed that the the whole all, all of this pursuit of glory is justified by the poem itself it's like all this war and suffering is for the sake of the poem that we can enjoy years, you know, three and a half thousand years later. <laughs> and um, yeah. when when it's when we are fated to die, then the idea of of living on in the minds of other people um, doesn't seem like such a pallid, you know, shadow of immortality, which we were never able to have anyways Grass. but it seems yeah. like it seems like quite a quite an incredible achievement to strive for and to attain absolutely you know i noticed this when a lot of when a lot of people i respect you know um especially when i was first getting into this sort of you know alt-right slash manosphere slash you know jack donovan type thing probably around 2013 14 ish um you know one of the things both him and master chim and a bunch of other people that i've you know looked into they talk a lot about legacy they talk a lot about um you know just building a legacy that you can be proud of whether it's through your family through your friends or just through your actions on their own um you know it's a very powerful and solid concept you know and it's it's something that you know as i get older now i start to try to strive toward you know it's not just and i was talking about this with my girlfriend the other day it's like it's not just me thinking for me me thinking short term me thinking okay what's what should I do next? What you know feels nice? It's more like, what would I do now that would affect down the line and make a better legacy for me and for my progeny? You know, and that's a very deep thing to think about. You know, especially in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I, well, I wrote something on my author page, and I'll, I'll I'll probably link a number of these things in the description here. But I Feel free. I wrote actually exactly about what you're describing: the importance of legacy. Um, I'll just read it verbatim. Here it goes. Sure. The genealogical sections of the great stories, like the Bible and the Aeneid and the Iliad, are always yawned away as the most boring sections. Yet there's always a genealogical section in the great epics which built civilization. Why is this? I think our own boredom about these genealogies says something about our relationship with our culture. 
In older times, stories were told in local geographies with contiguous genetic and cultural heritage. There was a very high chance that, if someone were to tell the story of the Iliad, your great-great-grandfather's name might be listed among the ship captains of the Second Scroll, or at the very least, you might hear the king under which your great-great-grandfather served. Your family, your genes, were in the story, and so the story belonged to you, as well as to the other people whose ancestors participated in that war, Trojan or Achaean. Yes. It is very plausible that genealogies may in fact have been the most compelling and important parts of these epics for the purpose of persuading listeners of the story's relevance, and in doing so in establishing cultural wisdom, norms, shared myths, and eventually a civilization. If you have a place in the myth, you have a place in the society. Today it seems that we have more myths, but fewer that give meaning and place to the people they are told to. Fantasy, science fiction, and high literature all establish culture, but they do so without attachment. They are impersonal and rootless. One of the best modern exceptions to this trend is aptly titled Roots. A book I've been reading through recently is Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens, which argues that the creation of myths is one of our defining traits and most powerful abilities. It allowed us to organize into groups through the creation of trust, which Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons could not emulate. I think Harari is correct on this point, and the much maligned political polarization America has been dealing with reflects a breakdown of the myths that held us together. I don't know if we can bring back to life myths back to life or not. Some mythical heroes come back after three days when they're killed, but Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Kennedy are not Jesus. They are dead, they remain dead, and we have killed them. Perhaps this is why the ancients hated blasphemy with such seriousness. But we can tell new stories and eventually create new myths, which will be relevant to our children because they are about their ancestors. Perhaps more than anything else, this is how we can find ourselves and return to our own roots. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> no, I, I've noticed this sort of, the, the genealogical aspect and just the way that we're, you know, I'm going to be honest, everything that we're doing now, you know, with certain symbols that we take on, even, you know, even though I decry it myself, you know, take sports, for example, the sport logos that we use, the, the, the names of the teams, you know, it, it's just a, a pallid attempt to create this sort of tribalism that, you know, it, it's not there, but you're trying to make it artificially, you know? Yeah. And since you're talking about, you know, localism and things like that, you know, think about the... Uh, the organic stores where they sell, you know, local craft beer, local cheeses, you know, on and on and on. Or they talk about how the farmer, you know, lives a few miles away from the store, you know. And that, that appeals to a lot of people. And, you know, granted, there are plenty of hipsters that, you know, do it to put their nose up in the air. But there are a lot of people also who, I don't know, I think we as a whole crave that connection. We as a whole crave that sort of mythological connection, ancestral connection, and to be very honest, we don't we don't have that anymore. And that's part of what I wanted to touch on real fast. You know, it's like with the Iliad, with the Odyssey, it, it just it showcases a lot of aspects of society that we have either lost or no longer have. And I think that's what I wanted to put down. Absolutely. And and I think I think in your bringing up of, of these uh, sort of local marketplaces you're you're ever so subtly touching on the um relationship between people and the land that yes. um, that sort of binds people together it's hard to create a contiguous story a legacy if everyone's constantly moving around you know if, if my children move to virginia and their children move to uh korea and their children move to new zealand like there's no there's no connection into your past and um, I'm rather fortunate my uncle did a fair bit of genealogy on my uh, father's side anyways and so I, I I know the history of my family and how we came to the United States and a little bit of what we did prior to that but um, it seems that a lot of, a lot of people don't have that anymore it's not encouraged it's not a, a tradition that you uh, receive by default anymore. 
And I think people no. lose a lot of self knowledge and they lose a lot of inspiration in that you can get from saying, Well, you know, this is what my ancestors did, so I must be able to do it too. <laughs> it's funny you bring that up. Uh, one of my tattoos, actually, uh, the one I'm, I have a tattoo, and it's a tattoo of a Celtic knot, and it's a representation of uh, Brittany, which is in northwest France, and that's where I know that my ancestors came from, and I know that we were the, 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 the coastal area of, of the northwest coast of France. And, you know, on some level, it does guide me completely, whether I want to completely, you know, emulate that or not, it's still a driving force to me in a lot of the things that I do. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned that we, people no longer have, uh, a, have it by default. I remember when I was in, I think, elementary school slash the beginning of middle school, they would, one of the projects was to make um, kids sort of write out a, a family tree. I'm not sure if they still do that anymore, but I remember that being a very key assignment when I was a little kid, you know? So it's interesting how even within, let's say, nine, late 90s, early 2000s, um, it was still something there, but it's just receded as the years have gone on. Yeah. Well, I actually, I think I remember being made to do an assignment like that too, but it was a genetics assignment. So we were tracking who had brown hair and who had blue eyes and who had, you know... Um, Detached Where their earlobes ear to the yeah yeah, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> whatever. Hey, you know, there was nothing in that genealogy about like learning that my you know uh, maternal great grandfather used to sit in the basement listening to the radio, smoking cigars and looming carpets, or the fact that my you know great great grandfather on my father's side emigrated to the United States from Scotland as a judge, or or anything like that. That's the, or... the stories. That seem to to imbue us and our our expectations and our aspirations in this short life with uh, significance, with a sense of duty, I suppose. Absolutely, I you know I, I found a, one of my ancestors. One of the one of my main ancestors was actually a soldier and a poet uh, in France during I think the whole. I'm not sure where exactly, but I know it was around like the Huguenot times, Catholic versus Protestant, that sort of thing. Um, and he served under, I believe it was Henry IV, if I'm not mistaken. But it's, you know, it's interesting when you talk about the stories being sort of this motivation and this, this drive to sort of think, wow, you know, this is what my ancestors did, or in your case, you know, your grandpa, and this is what they did, you know. And then you start thinking to yourself, is like some of the things that I do, is it the same habits they had? Is it... it it makes you ask a lot of questions, and it's kind of fun finding out the answers in that front. <laughs> well, and, and there's also an extension of identity, which is another subject I'm, I'm working on in my free time, um, that, that comes from genealogy as well. One of the great scenes with Diomedes, actually, in the midst of his godlike rampage across the battlefield, just killing everything, um, he runs across this Trojan named Glaucon, and they're about to face off with each other and as they're facing off they start taunting each other doing the normal soldier thing and uh Diomedes asks Glaucon who his who his parents are and Glaucon says why why bother asking who I'm from the generations are like leaves some come and some go and they're to be replaced by another one but ironically it was his own father's relationship with Diomedes father that kept them from fighting and they exchanged armors and became friends despite being on opposite yep. sides of the battlefield and that was directly due to the identity that they had inherited I remember that scene I think it was one of the uh, probably one of the best scenes in the whole Iliad and I think interestingly since you brought up Diomedes uh, he's definitely one of my favorite characters for sure if not my favorite character in the Iliad but you know, even when Athena speaks to him a lot of the time, part of how she gets him to sort of get up and keep going is she compares him to his father, but not in like a negative way. But, you know, she was basically saying, you know, your father hath gained my favor via his constant, you know, fighting, his constant battling, his constant drive, his thumos, even if you could call it that. And, you know, it kind of spurs him forward in a sense, you know, probably more so than Athena herself trying to speak to him is that sense that he's trying to live up to the legacy of his father, but not, not in the negative way that we usually associate with that nowadays. Yeah. He's, he's trying to, to 
to keep up the family reputation, really. You know, his father Absolutely. was a great warrior. And one of the opening scenes of the Iliad, in fact, is where the, um, oh, I forget his name. It's not Nestor. I think it might have been Nestor is chastising Ooh, Agamemnon and Achilles. He's like, oh, I knew soldiers much greater than you. I Nestor. No one... <laughs> it's probably Nestor. I'm remembering it now. Yeah, it's probably Nestor. <laughs> he's like, he's like you, my guys, days. <laughs> you guys aren't anything like the soldiers I knew once. But, and of course, no one knows those soldiers' names that he's mentioning. Everyone knows Achilles and Agamemnon. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he starts like naming off different soldiers that would be known to those soldiers at that time. Because, as you've talked about, with this sort of connecting legacy, and I think Nestor himself, if we're talking more about legacy, he was a living legacy in his own way, because as elderly as he was, and maybe he wasn't the greatest warrior of them all anymore, um, he still had a connection to the past that they valued highly, and his wisdom, because of that connection, was valued very highly. Oh, you know, yeah. And he knew, he probably knew every soldier's father in there. He's like, I served with your father in the great sea battle of... Thalamus, you know, something along those lines. So it was a very interesting way to keep that linkage up. What, one of Agamemnon's lines to Nestor was, if only I had ten advisors as wise as you, this war would be over, you know, yesterday. Yeah. Um, we would soon have the city. Um, yeah. Well, I could spend just hours talking about the Iliad. Let's let's move oh, to the Odyssey yeah. briefly, <laughs> though, briefly, um, yeah. where we have a dramatically different kind of hero, the in Odysseus, with with yeah. Achilles, and even with Hector and Diomedes, you have guys, mostly with Achilles, who are who seem fundamentally motivated by a sense of honor and duty in the face of death. Whereas Odysseus, and and they're very, um, you know, some people will criticize Achilles as being very monodimensional. Very, uh, he's a, a one-sided guy. He's just really angry, and he cares about justice, and he's been wronged, so now he wants things put right. Uh, and then he gets wronged again. Whereas Odysseus is repeatedly described as, like, the man of many paths. He's very adaptive. He's very cunning. And he's, very. he's, the, he's the one who survives. He's the one who, he's the, the one guy, him and Menelaus are like the only two guys who have a happy ending at the end of all this. And I believe Diomedes might have a happy ending as well, but I'm not 100% of what happened to him at the end. But Fair out enough. of the two ma maiden guys, probably, yeah, those two. Yeah, uh, I, I know Agamemnon doesn't do well, Hector doesn't do well, Priam doesn't do too well, Paris, I th Paris. think, gets away, but we all hate him anyways. Um. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a coward. Even in modern times, he's still kind of a coward. Um, yeah. Aeneas gets away, but he founds a, di a different civilization down the line. Well, he's the um, the, the progenitor of the Romans, so, exactly. If we're to believe the the stories, yes. Um, Father I, of Rome. <laughs> I've been working through a a theory of a left right political breakdown based on the the. Um, Achilles versus the Odysseus instinct. Do we serve justice first, or do we serve survival first? And I, I don't mean left-right as a criticism of either kind, because I think, I mean, I would consider myself on the political right, but I personally like uh, Achilles more than I like Odysseus, as admirable as Odysseus is. And Achilles is the guy who's interested in justice and who's accepted his, his death. Yeah. I mean, but I can understand Odysseus' motivation as well. You know, his main motivation, Odysseus, is to get home to his wife and son. You know, and that, I think, drives him along through everything. It makes him lose a lot. And he, you know, I think he only gets there with... He gets there, his crew's all dead, and he's basically the lone survivor of that entire, you know, of the entirety. Granted, his crew did a lot of stupid things, but in the very end, regardless, he's the final survivor. Well, right, the and... opening lines are, Tell me, O muse, of that ingenious hero who traveled far and wide after he had sacked the famous town of Troy. Many cities did he visit, and many were the nations with whose manners and customs he was acquainted. So you get this idea of this very versatile guy. Moreover, he suffered much by sea while trying to save his own life and bring his men safely home. But do what he might, he could not save his men, for they perished through their own sheer folly in eating the cattle of the sun god Hyperion. 
So, yeah, Disgusting. there was nothing he could do <laughs> to stop the well, gods. No, he did. Yeah, but I mean, if, you know, of course not. But I mean, he did let his cunning get away with him in a sense. If you remember the story with, I believe the name was Polyphemus, Polyphectus? I'm, I'm botching the name, but the Cyclops. Polyphemus, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Polyphemus, where he blinds the Cyclops, um, you know, after seeing his men basically get eaten in front of him and devoured and murdered. Um, he finally comes up with a plan, cunning, there we are, you know, takes the, takes the rod, slams it into uh, the eye of the Cyclops, and then manages to get whatever men are left on the boat and get out of there. He turns back, um, and he's so proud and probably arrogant, uh, that he's basically yelling, um, he basically gives up who he really is, and he's like, you know, I am Odysseus, um, I have blinded you, or something like that, uh, if I remember correctly. I don't remember the finer details, but basically that's what brings Poseidon's wrath down on him, you know, for the whole rest of the trip. <laughs> yeah, the Greeks really didn't like hubris. They didn't like pride in the face of the gods. <laughs> they didn't like, uh, no. they didn't like it with Icarus and Daedalus, they didn't like it with Odysseus, they didn't like it with Ajax, who was challenging Poseidon himself, who promptly oh, dropped him off a cliff into the sea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, and it's interesting because, you know, I, you know, a lot of what gets talked about as confidence today gets mistaken for arrogance. But, see, I, I noticed this because I'm a, I'm a boxing fan and I'm a mixed martial arts fan. The arrogant ones, the ones who are full of hubris, um, are the ones that are so legitimately blinded by whatever skill they have that they can't see how they need to improve, you know. Um, the difference between, um, you know, someone who, you know, is confident but backs it up and makes sure that, you know, he does what he needs to do versus someone who is utterly arrogant, and even if they lose, they still retain that same arrogance. You know, in a way, it's like watching, uh, watching the gods play out in its own weird way. Um, and you notice that arrogance is not a problem because you are confident. Arrogance is the problem because it blinds you the same way that weakness will blind you. Absolutely. Uh, and it, I absolutely enjoyed the McGregor Mayweather fight. Uh, McGregor, I, I think, do. is probably the, the, the pinnacle example of what you're talking about. There's no guy who's cockier than that. But no. uh, like you said, you know, hubris blinds someone. And McGregor is not just, um, a good fighter he's he's probably got the best vision and visualization skills of any fighter ever absolutely probably absolutely he's he's literally like sherlock holmes from the uh the movie where he the movie plans i remember that where he starts, and... <laughs> starts <laughs> playing out everything in his head and then executes it almost immediately yeah and, that, I, I, so and amazing. when he goes into the fight with mayweather and mayweather goes in with uh, a well planned strategy and eventually beats him and yeah. um mcgregor was a phenomenal sport about it. says yeah it was a good fight he beat me fair and square and he chastises <laughs> the judge a little bit says he should have let him finish me <laughs> yeah that's, well because that's yeah that's he the comes exact from the kind of opposite sport. that's the exact opposite of of arrogance and hubris it's funny i can i can give a quick example of arrogance and hubris right now uh his name is alistair overeem very well-known Dutch heavyweight kickboxer, strong guy, staunchly good skills, but for years he was arrogant as all hell. Um, and it wasn't until very recently, after he got knocked out in a lot of brutal mixed martial arts matches, a lot of brutal knockout losses, that he finally realized, okay, I have to change up a few things and not be so, you know, arrogant about my skills. And it's led to him becoming pretty darn well, pretty doing very well for himself. So, you know... Um, you, you can see that ha happen again and again and again, you know, and it's interesting because boxing actually originated in Greece and Pancration was the forefather of MMA. Um, so it's very interesting to see sort of these concepts play out, you know, to see hubris still being punished in its own way and to see, you know, confidence is a necessity, but at the same time you have to be humble enough First to officially recognize when you need to change in a good way. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I absolutely agree. And that's one of the, probably one of the greatest faults of Agamemnon that keeps him from improving and understanding what's going on <laughs> around him. Absolutely. Because he seems, absolutely. he's not a terrible king in his good moments, but he seems to get lost in his own desire and his own self-regard. Absolutely. And refuses the, uh, the advice of, people wiser than himself when it matters um, yeah 
which eventually leads to his uh well i'm death. not sure that's exactly what leads to his death that the, the, he's there's a great line of stories about the um the family atreides that i think Aeschylus writes about where the, the he's basically inherited a a, a cursed legacy uh, speaking of legacies as we were before of course um I forget who his ancestor was who attempted to feed uh, human flesh to the gods, and they weren't. I believe that was. Um, oh was it God. Sisyphus? Tantalus. Tantalus. No, no, Sisyphus was the rock. I believe Tantalus was the one who tried to feed his. I think son. you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is another. Form that was of, where the phrase. Which is another. Yeah, I was going to say that was where. The, yeah, and that was where the phrase tantalizing comes from, because that was his punishment for his hubris and for his vile crime to be placed in um, a pool of water that would always re retreat from him and to be placed next to some grapes that would always retreat from him. So he would never, you know, find, fulfill his hunger. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how relevant these problems are to bring it a little bit more modern yeah. and into the political realm. Um, I mean, I think both of us would consider ourselves to be members of the alt-right, or at least supporters of it. Um, Absolutely. My, my views are a little different, but yes, I agree. <laughs> oh, of course. Well, there's there's a lot of variance. You know, Democrats Absolutely. don't all agree with each other. Republicans don't all agree with each other. And there's, there's variance in the alt-right. But it seems Absolutely. to me that a lot of these alt-right groups have been um, – uh, you, you – have wound up with leaders who are remarkably hubristic in their behavior. <laughs> yes. I, I hate to say it, but it's absolutely true. And I was about to talk about something about leadership in a little bit, but I'm going to let you finish that point. <laughs> well, it, it all stems from a, a piece I wrote for Countercurrents a while back where I was, I mean, Vox Day, I, I love Vox Day. I think he's one of the, one of the best writers for the alt-right we have. Um, but, and I am not a national socialist. I don't agree with national socialism. I think there's a lot of problems with it. But I think it's wrong to reject, to eject national socialism from the right and say these people completely. aren't our people. It's like, we, I we, agree may, we may disagree about desired ends. You know, I, I might think that, uh, you know, the Ba'ath Party, which is one of the more common national socialist parties we have today in the world um it is going astray in a number of ways economically mostly and centralized control whatever but uh, to say that it's not right wing is just wrong and um i think that the best way we can delineate whether something is right or left um com comes down to the i'm sort of getting off track here but comes down to the the homeric distinction between the the achilles and the odysseus models do you care more about justice or do you care more about survival and it seems to me that the the virtually all national socialist parties and most fascist parties throughout history were fundamentally motivated by a drive to survive in the face of uh, cultural and demographic uh e and political erasure Mostly in the face of communism, but not exclusively. So in the Ba'ath Party's case, uh, a lot of those, as far as I'm aware, arose as a response to Western interference in nationalizing their uh, their economic resources. Of course, and I mean, I, I I would rewind it back a little bit. You know, my I've been reading a little bit about phalangism, uh, so to speak, and from the 27 points, or even from Mussolini's doctrine of fascism. It is about survival, but it is also about justice. It's an attempt to sort of combine the two, because yes, we, as, you know, their view is saying yes, we as a people need to survive, but at the same time, you know, and even look at the symbol that they chose, the symbol which is the fasces. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but fasces um, is the symbol of uh, ancient Rome. It was the symbol of justice. It was the symbol of sticks basically being bundled together with an axe on top, meaning that we will band together for this survival for sacred common good but the axe is justice meaning we will apply justice to those that seek to bring down the the survival we seek to bring down the unity seek to bring down the country or the people however you want to put it and i think that you know at least with you know, 
phalangism, for example, it was most definitely a third way. And I think the mistake that people often make on all sides is that they tend to make a right versus left distinction with solely based on economics. You know, and I see this all the time, even among the friends that do so happen to be NS, is that one of the things that gets argued about a lot is the economic side of things, when in reality, the economics to me should be secondary to the, the goal at hand, which is to get revive the animating spirit of our people and to figure out how best we will survive. You know, and the rest is just great. Yeah, a a absolutely. And the, the idea of legitimate authority uh, as symbolized by the fascists is, um, I mean, the right wing isn't opposed to justice, just as the left wing isn't opposed to survival. One of the things I love about the Homeric model and distinction between right and left is that it, it inherent is the in the model is the synergy because they're both written by the same author you know justice is designed to aid in survival survival and you're not going to have a just society if you don't survive so survive, yes <laughs> <laughs> so uh um th they're both synergistic but people are are motivated by different things and it seems to me that the the left uh and you can particularly see this in academia is just so alienated from the concept of violence and and from a fear of death that uh, yes it, it doesn't even register in their minds emotionally and so justice becomes the main uh question whereas if you look at the u.s military which is overwhelmingly conservative by comparison um, yes these are guys who deal with life and death on a day-to-day -day basis everything about their like daily all the habits that they're imbued with in boot camp are designed to aid in their survival should you know some some catastrophe hit or should the enemy attack it, everything yes. revolves around survival and reducing the chances of survival of the enemy so yes it it, it seems to me that the the motivation to survive uh the the odysseus motive is the fundamentally right-wing one whereas the the motive for justice is the left-wing one and the goal is not to say we want a right-wing society or we want a left-wing society but to balance these two emotional motivations among the citizens in such a way as to optimize the well-being of society as a whole because we want we want a society that exists so we want to survive yes. but we also want a just society you know which are the fundamental questions that Aristotle and Plato attempted to adjust. What is the just society? See, and it's interesting because I, I was talking about this in an interview a while back with a friend of mine who, uh, you know, is actually an S. I think I'll probably dig up the link to that interview. Uh, this was back in December. Um, but I was talking about how the left has basically monopolized uh, the word social justice, when in reality the real social justice came about via, you know, the survival of the, the working class in this case. You know, it was a Catholic priest by the name of Father Coughlin who was very much against what we would now consider, you know, usury, international banking, um, outsourcing, uh, those sorts of things. And, you know, he coined the term social justice because it was, you know, a f method of survival for the, for the working class. Um, and now as we see, and I've noticed this, that the left, or like the modern left, tends to do this a lot. They tend to take words that meant one thing and then pervert them to make them mean something radically different than what the original meaning was. And, you know, even while we're talking, I still have to sort of um, recognize that the words in the modern context that we're using now meant something much different than the way it was originally written. You know, honor being a prime example. Uh, absolutely. I didn't know that Father Coughlin um, coined the word social justice. I think the first user of the term might have been John Stuart Mill, but he might Possibly. not have popularized it in the way that Father Coughlin did, who I, I actually yeah. am not very familiar with Father Coughlin's work, though I was recently compared to him <laughs> by a family member. <laughs> so I'm like, I better, nice. uh, I better learn more about this guy. Um, take, take that as a compliment, man, because, I mean, my thing with that is, you know, he, he had a very popular radio show back in the 30s, and this was during the Depression, and, you know, he was against communism, against these sorts of, 
things that we would consider. But at the same time, he pushed for things that we would consider socialistic in nature, you know. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head, but I remember, you know, it, it was synergistic in a way, where he wanted justice for the working people, for the people that went out in the fields and worked and sweated and bled and then had their money and, you know, and land and crops taken away by, you know, bankers or interests or however, you know, whatever had, had gone wrong. Um, but he was coming from a place of survival, and now that I'm talking about that sorts of things, I start to recognize what you mean, whereas, you know, it's it's something quite different, because the right, like you said, is primarily, primarily concerned about survival, whereas the left is concerned about justice, but it's more of an abstract justice. Yeah, yeah. and I, I hate to ruin a perfectly good pagan conversation with a Christian <laughs> comment, but um, I think, I think <laughs> this, is where the, this is where the, the importance of, of the the desire to serve other people really comes into play. Um, one of the, the sort of libertarian criticisms of the, um, the welfare state and the social safe, uh, safety, safety nets net. and things like that is that they're, they're just not as effective as things like churches and community programs where, where people are actually familiar with the people that they're helping and they understand what their needs actually are rather than the sort of Kafkaesque systems that governments create, not, not out of malice or incompetence, but by necessity. I mean, the scale is just so large in a country of, you know, for example, 330 million people. Um, you can't... It, there's no way you can deal with people at an individual level. Whereas if you create a, a culture that maybe values social justice in, in the sense that you're talking about and other national socialists talk about, where we, we care about the working class. I mean, this is what socialism used to be all about. It's sort of what communism claimed to be about. Though George Orwell obviously had a different opinion. He thought, no, oh, these people don't love the poor. They just hate the rich. Uh, it's just resentment. Yeah, to poke in a little bit with the with the Orwell quotes, I you know to jump off that, I believe it's interesting that you know it's always very interesting that you know a lot of the ranks of the communists and or even Antifa nowadays, they don't they're never usually they're never the poor they're never the working class they're usually always the middle class the, the or the ones who grew up in the trust fund or the ones who you know had mommy and daddy pay for everything for them yeah. you know maybe some of the non-white members you can find some poor you know poor and angry person but the the the, the, the white ones as interesting as this sounds racially um they're they they had everything handed to them they were pampered they were spoiled you know it's it's I don't know. I just <laughs> you can hear the disgust in my or voice the... because I'm just like I'm white, just scrapping. White, 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 white. Of course, yes. They they have uh, hook noses, uh, curls, um, uh, a funny blue hat on their head, and uh, oh, they they claim to be white. <laughs> I, I, I actually I was I was surprised because uh, I've been to a few rallies in the Pacific Northwest area, and they yeah. they'll have signs in in Arabic and in Hebrew. Ah. among the antifa and it's like what are you I doing? wonder why what are you doing well it's well so I mean strange. my own my own personal view is that Semites are the real enemy that you know we will have the globalist um, enemy tend to be both Judaic and Arabic in origin um, you know I'm not gonna get too into details with that or I'm gonna get more heated but yeah. you know it's well, we can, it's we definitely can... a trouble we, we can discuss the jq perhaps at a, a future day i've been sort of vacillating <laughs> between the two i i've 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 come back around to the idea that that jews are actually a pretty i mean whatever your opinion positive or negative um yeah even even the most radical anti-semite has to to grant the remarkable nature of the jewish people and i think it's i think they're an interesting people and um frankly i've i've quite enjoyed the company of most of the, the Jews I've met in my personal life. Um, and there are a few that I, I reference in, in my writing and, and go to for, for uh, political and historical matters and things like that. Actually, one of the ones I was quoting earlier today, um, Daniel Mendelssohn is Jewish. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's... I, the, it, oh, sorry, there's I didn't value want to... to it. The the you know the differences between people don't necessarily have to include, um, you know, hatred for for another group purely based upon its its nature. Though, as you know, Greg Johnson has pointed out, 
when you blend two incompatible cultures together, it's you're you're inevitably going to get some hatred. It's just yes. the, the nature of multiculturalism, and people don't seem to be willing to explore the differences between Semitic and European culture. No, I, I can understand that completely, you know, and I've noticed it, it tends to be mainly some philosophers on the European New Right. I, um, my girlfriend sent me a um, Pierre Krebs book, I believe it's Fighting for the Essence, uh, as a Christmas present, and, um, you know, I've read it, and he does make something of an effort to sort of separate that, so to speak, and he tends to take a heavily pagan form of European culture and that it's a necessity and that we have to revive that in order to have any hope of, you know, racial survival. But going back to what you were saying about the Jews, um, you know, when, when you talk um, hatred of other races, it's not, it's not needed, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Granted, yes, there is going to be some inevitable, you know, mistrust, hostility, on and on and on and on, and inevitably you will may have to feel a certain kind of way about an enemy who is trying to call you their enemy, make you their enemy, push you to that point. Um, but I will say this, though, realistically, in high school, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was something of a conservative, pro-Israel, the whole works. Um, and I had a friend of mine give me a, uh, a CD of a Jewish nationalist by the name of Mir Kahan. And it's interesting, the irony of, you know, me talking about how a Jewish nationalist inspired me. But, you know, that was, I think, one of the first seeds of nationalism kind of planted in my mind, you know, because he spoke about, you know, um, the Jews needing to have their own homeland um, and to keep their own homeland, not to mess around with other, you know, nations, but to be in, you know, in his case, Israel, and to remain there and to be there and to let the Arabs have their own land and let other races have their own land and the Jews will have their own land and they will defend that, you know, with all forth, you know, with all proper force. Um, and I'm like, well, this makes sense and this would be easier than a lot of, you know, what's going on now. And, you know, as I've gotten older and seeing, you know, that Jews aren't always a monolith, it, it does sort of gray the issue up a little bit, so to speak. Yeah, and, and to bring it back to, to Homer and the, the Iliad and these sorts of um, Greek attitudes about warfare and conflict and the enemy, um, yeah. so, some of Nietzsche's uh, thoughts on, on conflict are that, like, the, the, the best war is the one where you respect your enemy. And even if the most... Ob like objectively paranoid conspiracy theories about Jewish control of the world or whatever are true. At the very least, you can you can um, you would do best to respect them, and, um, and I, I think that's the way out of the the nihilistic black hole that the the uh, the fear of death can bring. Like. S suppose your race is fated to die as uh, your individual person is fated to die you might th there's probably no more Homeric line uttered in the 20th century than Winston Churchill's oh there's gonna be some alt-right cringes of that but <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> the the this is our final finest hour moment you know May yes. maybe maybe we won't make it but the the fight that we're going to put up is going to be remembered for centuries, and maybe it'll give some hope to people that will come after us to continue the fight to, you know, to rule ourselves, to be our own people, distinct from the, the Germans or the Jews or the Americans or <laughs> whoever you want to be distinct from. Of course, and it's interesting because I believe... Um... Mosley, um, there's a Mosley speech, and I wish I could dig it up, Oswald Mosley. Um, there was a speech where he was talking to people, and he said, you know, yes, uh, it's, of course, it's all against us, you know, they, the radio, the newspapers, the media, um, popular opinion, of course it's all against us, um, but it's there, we just have to reach out and grab it, we have to reach out and stand up and fight. And then he goes on to talk about Europeans basically being in worse situations with regards to the Crusades, with regards to the Battle of Vienna, the Battle of Tours, and things like that, where he says, you know, Europeans have beat back the, the holds time and time again, you know, and he says, I believe the phrase is, Europe lives and marches on, you know, and just this very inspirational speech where you could tell that even if Mosley knew his... Um, 
his philosophy was fated to die, he would at least be the best example that he could be. You know, and I, it's it's very Homeric in a sense, and you can see echoes of that, so to speak. Even with the Confederates, if I may dare say so, you know, they knew that some knew perhaps that they were fated to uh, to go down, but they tried to fight. They, they did their best. Yeah, it's this sort of the Leonidas thing. I'm I might die, but I'm gonna oh, die yes. oh. on my I'm gonna die on my feet, and they're gonna they're gonna remember us for all of time. And perhaps that's what's the most the the binding thing about Achilles and Odysseus, though they both might have different motivations and they mo both might have different worldviews. They both stand tall and don't turn their back when they're faced with impending death. And yes. I think that's what makes, in each to different audiences, because one of the things that uh, Mendelssohn noted is that you know some people like the Iliad and some people like the Odyssey and there isn't much overlap, but it, it, each in their own way there's something inspiring about that that courage and that steadfastness and that um, that spiritedness, that thumos in the face of death, that's yes. inspiring and, and relevant today. Perhaps will always be relevant. Absolutely. Well, I think we're we're coming up on about an hour here. Is there anything else you wanted to say on on the subject of Homer and the Odyssey and politics before we take off? I would think that, you know, you brought up a while back that we can create a culture of sorts. And I think if there's any one thing that we need to constantly focus on, you know, put aside our egos, put aside anything else, no matter what worldview you're in, I think the one thing we do have to create, so to speak, is this culture of, of heroism, this culture of duty, this culture of honor. And I know that's probably as tall as Everest right now with our modern world, but I think that's what we need to dedicate ourselves to, building a culture of honor and duty and and pride in one's accomplishments and, you know, wisdom and, you know, just, just the sense of local community that we can be proud of and that we can relate to and we can be a part of, you know, our tribe, you know. Yeah, uh, well, I think the the preeminent psychologist on uh, good and evil, Philip Zimbardo, would agree with you there. The psychology of heroism, the idea of, of duty is... Um, it's a way of finding meaning and the idea that someone might might sing poems in your honor down the, down the road is a when, when there isn't much else existence has to offer you it's a pretty it's a pretty optimistic thing it's pretty uh, it helps helps me get out of bed in the morning some days anyways yeah the, the, it's funny I have this quote in my mind I, I don't know if you maybe you've noticed I take a lot of inspiration from the Spartans strangely enough um, and there's a phrase that echoes in my head constantly um, you come back with your shielder on it and that's that's just how I've slowly started to you know push myself in that way you know <laughs> come back with your shielder on it well one hero did the former and one hero did the latter Achilles and Odysseus Indeed. but uh, <laughs> They, they both, they both that sums it all up. They both did it with style. So Indeed. <laughs> I think that's a good point to end on. Uh, thanks so much for chatting, Frank, and I'm sure we'll do more of these in the future. Oh, I look forward to it, Christopher. All we right. definitely will. Take care. Good night. <laughs>